I am one of the co-hosts, Sun Guy, along with Joseph Schwartz, and Hello. I want to bring our guest with us today on Right Away. We have with us one of the biggest men in professional wrestling, a man that's trained a lot of the stars you see today. We have with us Total Protection, Mr. Hughes. Welcome to the program, sir. Hey, great to be with you today. What's cracking? Oh, doing great here on a Tuesday. Now, for the benefit of our listeners that may not know the history, can you tell them how you got involved in professional wrestling? Well, you know, growing up watching it in Kansas City, uh, in the Central States area, Kansas City, Kansas, uh, uh, you know, they used to run shows there at Memorial Hall and, um, a lot of the stars that, you know, growing up, I watched Holly Race, Ric Flair, Andre the Giant, um, you know, uh, Bulldog Bob Brown, Rufus R. Jones. I can go on and on. And those are, uh, guys that I watched growing up on every Thursday night, uh, on Channel 41 in Kansas City. And I got kind of, you got addicted to watching wrestling growing up. And, uh, it's something that I always wanted to do. And, uh, you know, but I was all American sports guy anyway. I was in three sport, all American, so forth and so on. And junior high and high school. And I went to K state and, um, uh, but in the back of my mind, I always wanted to be a professional wrestler. So I finished all my sports. And then once I got done with college, I pursued wrestling full throttle and, uh, did some research, found the right trainer and Bob Geigel and Sonny Myers. And, uh, here I am, talking to you guys. What a great career I have had. Absolutely. Now, when you were watching professional wrestling in Kansas City, were you aware of like people like Harley Race and Bob Geigel oh. and uh, <laughs> people like that being instrumental in being the people that ran the promotion at the time, or right. did you learn that once you got in? Well, you know, at the time, you know, I didn't know all that. <clears throat> Excuse me, I didn't know all that at the time when I was watching it growing up. But, you know, I mean, it was a good territory. A lot of people came through there. I mean, tons and tons of, you know, veterans came through Kansas City. I mean, if you was a wrestler and you was a veteran, you, you know, you were somebody, you came through Kansas City, you know, once upon a time. And... Uh, uh, when I was in high school, you know, and I started going on my own because when I was a younger fellow, my dad used to take us. But when I got older and started working, I could buy my own tickets and I would go and, and I would just go every Thursday night, every Thursday religiously. And I, then I started realizing that Bob Geiger was the promoter. Uh, he was running things. He was in charge. He was really, uh, in charge of the NWA years ago back when NWA was really hot before Crockett took it over and killed it. But anyway, that's besides the point. But, uh, <clears throat> yeah, you know, Bob Gaggle was the promoter and the booker. Uh, when I got through that, when I got finished with college, you know, I started, you know, pursuing different people that could help me become a professional wrestler. And being that he went to Iowa and I almost went there to play football, I didn't know he had followed my athletic career through high school and college. And so when it came to looking for a trainer, he already knew who I was. So I got blessed to not get charged for in the training. So it all worked out. Um, years later, mm -hmm. when you're in WCW being managed by Harley Race, what was it like when they first told you he was going to be your manager? When they first picked me up from AWA, I already knew Harley from Kansas City. You know, he was there. I'd wrestled him before on a couple of indie shows uh, after I got trained and started doing shows at ESPN for AWA. Um, um, I guess they saw me on AWA and saw what I could do. And I didn't know this at the time, but me and Lex Luger had the same finish. And so, uh, you know. They gave me a call, and long story short, I came to Atlanta. 
and uh, I ran my little run as Big Cat, and then um, fought Luger. We had torture rack matches and all that, and Harley Race was his manager, and so forth and so on. And so the bookers changed, and then, you know, Ole was the booker when I got there, and then the bookers changed after about six months, and then Dusty got the book and came to me and asked me if, you know, he told me he had a better gimmick for me, uh, which was the bodyguard gimmick, and he was going to stick me with Luger as his bodyguard, and Hardy Race was going to be our mentor, and which was, you know, I mean, you know, at that particular time when they told me that, I was, I was, you know, overwhelmed with joy because I used to watch, you know, both of these guys, and specifically Harley Race growing up, so he was like one of my idols, you know. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, here I am going to be with this guy riding down the highway, working with him. I mean, just doing all this, all this wrestling stuff with him. And, uh, it was amazing. Let me tell you. I mean, I learned a lot of stuff from the man and, uh, we did a lot of beer drinking, of course, too. But, you know, you know, I learned a lot about the business from Harley Race and I was blessed to be with him. Now you uh, mentioned the AWA and you were there. Uh, the last couple of years of that promotion, when you're wrestling for the AWA at the time, did you get a sense of them not being very long for the world at that point? Was it obvious to the people in the locker room that they were struggling to get by at that point? Well, you know, I mean, you know, the, at that particular time, I mean, they were hanging on by a thread. Uh, uh, you know, everything was in chaos, you know, um, WWF at the time was, was, was booming and, and, uh, WCW was booming. And so, you know, it was a little hard to compete, you know, with those two big companies as far as talent goes. And, you know, things were starting to change, you know, the times are changing and, uh, basically, you know, it was just pretty much, uh, on life support for a little while, but I thank God that I had opportunity to, go down to uh, Minnesota and get with the AWA and get on the ESPN on prime time, which came on at three in the afternoon. And uh, that's how I got noticed uh, uh, from, uh, you know, WCW. And, uh, you know, when they went out of business, you know, I, you know, I was kind of, of course, a lot of guys went through AWA. I mean, a lot of superstars went through AWA. You know, if you was some kind of wrestler, you you you've been to AWA. I'm talking about from Hulk Hogan to, you know, Macho Man. Who you know, everybody went through AWA. So, you know, that was something that uh, I'm glad that I have on my resume, even though they are not in business anymore. You know, um, I just wish you know they would have had lasted a little longer for some, so some other guys could have had opportunity you know, to have that on their resume. But it was a good learning experience for me. I, you know, I got to, you know, wrestle a lot of interesting people and personalities and, and so forth and so on that helped me uh, in my career along the way after that. But uh, it was, it was you know, I was, you know, I, I hated to see it was going out of business, though. That, that kind of showed me that uh, the business world was kind of changing at that point. Oops. Hey. I was... When you were with the AWA, did you have a lot of interaction with the Ganyas, or were they just strictly uh, in the production end of things at that point, and you didn't necessarily talk to them much? Well, yes, I did. I talked to them quite a bit, actually. Uh, Vern, I mean, uh, Vern and uh, and uh, and uh, his son, which I can't even think of his name right now, uh, well, Vern's dad, you know, he was, he was, uh, pretty highly, uh, interested in me. Uh, he called Gaggle up one day, uh, in Kansas City and, uh, you know, Gaggle, of course, put me over with him and told him I was a good athlete. You gotta take a look at me. And they said, so anyway, he sent me up there, uh, to, uh, uh, Minnesota where AWA was. And, uh, that's where I got my start as far as my first major TV, uh, debut. And, uh, you know, they always used to, uh, put me over all the time. I mean, they liked it. Me, I mean, I don't have no trouble. I got a push when I went there. So I was pretty blessed to get a push from them, you know. Now, jumping a few years ahead back to WCW, one of the more memorable angles you were in from my point of view was 
the angle with the junkyard dog where he headbutted you, shattered the glasses into your eyes, and you formed a tag team briefly with him. Was the tag team with the junkyard dog something that you saw more potential in than what we actually got, or was it always meant to be kind of a short run with him? Well, you know, I mean, I, I couldn't, first of all, I didn't understand why they did that, and I did later on. But at the time, you know, I'm sitting there going, well, now why in the world would they, you know, I was, I was Mr. Hughes, the bodyguard, you know, this, 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 this monster, you know, just, just defeating and terrorizing, terrorizing people and beating the heck out of people. And then I, all of a sudden, you know, I want to switch me back to this character that, you know, nope, you know, I'm pretty sure people probably didn't remember or care, it didn't care anything about. Uh, the Mr. Hughes gimmick was going forward and getting over pretty good. So basically in my mind, I was pretty, I was thinking, well, you know, maybe they, cause my contract was coming up to end. And so I guess they were just either, either they just want me to quit or just walk away. But I didn't do all that, you know, just basically just let the contract run out and I was done, you know, and that, and that's the only thing I can come up with, you know, figuring out that's the reason why that they did that, they put us together is because, you know, I mean, they weren't going to go anywhere anyway. But, you know, for the time being, that's what they did. I mean, that's just the way it worked back in the day, you know. If some, if, you know, if a promoter had something, your contract is about to run out, then you had to, you had to fill it in, you know, fill in the gaps, you know, until it, until it ends. So, anyway, you know, that's, that's how that went, so. Now, at the time that you were uh, – Doing that run with JYD, had they discussed with you morphing your gimmick at that point, or was that kind of something that was surprising to you, and that's what they ended up going with? Well, you know, they had told me what they were planning on doing, and then I was like, you know, really, I was kind of excited. Because, like I said, I was just, I was just was just big bodyguard guy. I got a serious push on television, and all of a sudden. You want to switch this gimmick back to Big Cat, which people are going like, wait a minute, what's up with this? You know. And so, you know, I really wasn't happy with it like that. And so, uh, you know, I'll let the, you know, let the contract run out and I was finished. Simple as that. Then they ended up going uh, overseas and then next thing you know, I went to WWF. Uh, so, you know, everything worked out in the long run. Um, WCW was very famous for their training school. They had a training school way before they really advertised it as much on TV as they did in the Nitro era. A lot of good talent got trained by the WCW school. Did you ever go down there and do a little bit of training with their school? No. No, no, I didn't need to. You know, I was already trained, man. I was already ready to rock and roll, you know. I mean, there was no need for me to get no more training. I was already a professional, you know. Um, I remember the school. I have went, I had went down there a few times because I knew SARS we tagged before. And, you know, I knew I knew a lot of the guys that were wrestlers. So, you know, I mean, of course I'd go over there every now and then and just sit around and look and see what they had going on over there. But, you know, I didn't need to train in there because I was already a professional, you know. So, so, yeah, I did go there, but, you know, to check it out and talk to, you know, Sarge and some other people that was there, you know, Sarge was the trainer at that time, so I'd go by there and check it out, me and T.C. Carter, because we would have had nothing better to do, and we go check it out and talk to hang out for a little while and go on with our lives, you know. Of course, uh, later on, several years later, uh, you got into the training <clears throat> aspect of the business. You've trained a mm -hmm. lot of bigger names, like we said in the opening. What led to you deciding that you wanted to teach the new generations of professional wrestlers? Well, you know, here's the thing. You know, from you know, just been been in the business for for all my life. Well, not actually in the business, watching it first of all, and then getting in the business in eighty seven, okay. And, you know, doing, living my dream and doing all the things I've done in this business, you know, I wanted to give back. And, and, you know, it was a passion of mine to teach, uh, because I was always, you know, perfection in this, when it comes to different things of wrestling, you know, holds and 
the, the, the psychology of it. I just like to teach people that and train people to see how they uh, would perform after they had some training from me. And once I started doing that and saw the performances that these guys were doing, then I got hungrier and hungrier to, to teach more and to focus more and be serious about it. And once I got serious about it, then that's when things start coming into place. Um, you know, I, mean, I did some studying on different matches of different wrestlers that I would watch. Good wrestlers, of course, old school style. And I would write down, jot down different things that I'd want to teach, you see. And uh, it was all old school stuff, you know. I wasn't in all that garbage. I mean, you know, be honest with you, I'm a, I'm a type of teacher and performer of the old school style of professional wrestling. I'll do that till I go on the ground. It's just bottom line. I don't care what they're doing on television. I don't care whatever they're doing. I'm still going to teach my way. And my way appears to work. Guys learn fast. I train thousands and thousands of people. I train superstars as well. You know, Heat Slater, Paulo Cruz, you got Moose, you know, you got Jonathan Gresham, you know, Kara Hogan, she's one of my girls that I train. She's going to go far in the business. And so, you know, I'm trying to train as many people as I can that love this sport, that want to live their dream. You know, you got thousands and thousands of young people that watch wrestling today, but they want to be on that screen and live their dream. How are they going to get there? You know, there's not too many people that can train you an old, old school style of wrestling to, because old school will never die. I don't care if it's 2016. It's still professional wrestling. I don't care what kind of season you put on it, but it's still professional wrestling. And a lot of people have stopped watching professional wrestling because of the different ways that guys are performing. And apparently it's not working. So old school, people love old style, old school professional wrestling. Okay, I'm talking about the way Ric Flair worked back in the time when he was young. I'm talking about Ricky Dragon, Steamboat, that style, Bret Hart, that style. You know, that, you know, you know, I go on and on about old school style and that's what I teach. And so when these guys go to these shows and they perform that way, they, they stand out. See? And that's the important thing. They stand out. And, uh, you know, I continually do that. I have a new school now over in Riverdale, and we'll get to that later. But, yes, to answer your question, you know, it's a pa you know, professional wrestling is a passion of mine. I love teaching young people how to be professional wrestlers. Well, I'm sure that you had to evolve a little bit, and you've learned as you've gone since you first started training. What's mm -hmm. one of the more surprising aspects of being a trainer that you wouldn't have expected going into that part of the business. You say, what is the most surprising aspect of it? Yes. Well, you know, I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't. I, now that's a rough question because I don't understand totally what you mean by that question. Uh, can you kind of, you know, simplify just a little more there? So, Cause I, I want to give you the right answer here. You know what I mean? Um, well, just, uh, was there any part of training that you hadn't anticipated being uh, something you would have to deal with that did come up well, once you started to get in training? Well, here's the thing, man. You know, I mean, there are certain things I teach. I teach the fundamentals, okay? I teach the basics. I teach that psychology. And I explain to you and show you and teach you how it's done simply. I, I simplify it to where it's not complicated. Okay, that's why when you know, you know, guys I teach they learn real fast because, of you know, I figured it out. You know, it took took about a year, but I figured it out. I figured out how to teach and train people how to how to how to be a professional wrestler. Now you know, when it comes to that fancy stuff, you know, all that high flying garbage. Well, that's all fine and dandy, but everybody can't fly. You understand? I, I teach the basic fundamentals of professional wrestling. Now, if you're an athletic guy and you want to learn that type of stuff, yes, I'll, I'll, I know how to teach you that. I'll use a couple of my people that are athletic that way to show you those type of things. But the basic things that I've done, like drop kicks and big bumps and all this other stuff that you would do, that you've seen Mr. Hughes do, 
you know, and, you know, I have, a, you know, a, a, a list of things that I show these young people, but, you know, certain things that, uh, I'm, I, you know, I really, you know, some things I just don't teach because it's not necessary, you know, I mean, I keep it pretty simple. I teach you the basics that you need to know to be a professional wrestler and be a good professional wrestler. You referenced Moose being one of your trainees, and he has been phenomenal since he started just in the last couple of years. Big, agile man, looks to have a bright future. He went from Ring of Honor to Impact Wrestling just in the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. When Moose first came to your school, did you see that type of potential in him that he would be at this level this soon? Oh, yeah, no doubt about it. I've seen that same thing in Nate, in Nate, you know, Paul Cruz, you know, Mason called him. Those guys are athletes, see? And, you know, I mean, the difference between those two and Heath is Heath had to really work a little, a little harder, you know, to, to, to get to the, to the level that these guys are at, but when they when 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 Moose came in, you know, he was already an athlete. First of all, he was playing pro football just like I did. I mean, I I was a natural athlete. You understand? So he was used to being trained. He was used to being taught. Okay. So basically, you know, you know, I just show him a couple. I show him one time, and he'd have something. I just the way it was. I mean, I show him one thing, one thing, and boom, he'd have it. So I was like, okay. Those are the type of people I like to train because they learn real fast and you can move right along with stuff. See, and here's the trick, you know, instead of just showing you one time and then we're done every day, you, we do the same thing and add something, same thing, add something, same thing, add something. So by the time three, you know, a month or two goes by, you got a lot of stuff accumulated in your mind. So you learn a lot of stuff, you know, cause we do it over and over and over. And so with him, he never got out of the ring. They should never get out of the ring. Every time, you know, I can hit one guy, he's in the ring, and then he's a, another guy on the side sparring with him, and I'm in the, you know, in the, in there taking him through stuff, you know, and one guy, you know, when you get done, all right, next guy get in, he'll never get out. He wants to stay in through the whole session. Somebody else gets out, he'll stay in there and go with them. You follow me so far? And so yes, those sir. guys never got out the ring. That's how they learn so fast. That's why they're so good. And so, you know, uh, I already knew that he was going to be a star because he was an athlete. Now, I, I was a big guy at one time. I'm not as big as I used to be, but I'm still a, a big guy. But, you know, I was in like 380, you know, 390 area, you know, at 6'3". And I was agile and things like that. I did drop kicks and tuck big old high bumps, so forth and so on. So I pretty much explained to him because, you know, I was a big guy before. And so I pretty much explained to him, hey, dude, you know, if you want to make it in this business, this is what you're going to have to let me teach you. These are the things that you're going to have to do to be noticeable in this business. And he listened to me, you know, and he does the best drop kicks in the business as a big man. So, you know. So he pretty much, you know, took took my advice and, and, and kept doing what I taught him, and it's working for him. Uh, you've had a relationship with WWE over the years. You had a few different runs with them over the mm -hmm. course of your career. What's the relationship like now, if there is one, uh, since you're training and they're picking up some of your trainees? Yeah. Well, my relationship with WWE is great. You know, I mean, they they, they use my talent and, that I train, and um, you know, uh, you know, I, everything's fine. I mean, it's it's rolling. You know what I'm saying? Everything's on the up and up, and uh, I'm looking forward to doing other things with them in the future. And uh, you know, it, it, it's just you know trying to produce some good talent out there for the for them and whoever else wants to you know use Mr. Hughes people. You know. Because you're going to get some good professional wrestlers that know how to wrestle. We're just not just doing stuff. You just, you know, they've been taught right, psychology, uh, telling stories. They're respectable. You understand? They, they, they understand the business. You know, you got a lot of people that they come in the business and they don't know anything. 
they're disrespectful. They don't, they don't get them. They don't teach them anything. And it's kind of, it's kind of depressing me if you think about it, because, you know, you got a lot of guys that don't have no business being in no wrestling ring. They got no business being in no shows. I mean, it's any scene is just overwhelmed with those kind of people that can't wrestle. And so I tell people it's real important. If you want to live your dream and be a good professional wrestler, you got to find the right person to teach you, man, and train you and teach you right. Don't just blow your money and then you don't know anything. You'll never live your dream. Yeah, you'll be a weekend warrior, no doubt, but you'll never make it to the big dance, period. One of the people that you were teamed up with at one point in your career was a younger Kevin Nash, and he, of course, went on to also be a bodyguard in his wrestling career for Shawn Michaels. He has said in several different interviews that being a bodyguard allowed him to learn and grow as a wrestler because he was able to observe from ringside without having to do the actual match, and he's able to see up close what they were doing wrong, what they were doing right. In your own career, do you think that having the bodyguard role helped you learn and grow as a wrestler also? Well, you know, every you know every little thing that I did coming up in the wrestling business helped me. You understand? Because one thing about this business here, man, you never stop learning. I don't care how long you've been in this business. You always learn. You pick up different things that can help you uh, out there, uh, you know, as far as performing. You know, so everything I did helped my career. It's just like now, you know, I got to teach people. You know, all that stuff I've done – all those years has have all those years have helped me teach guys how to wrestle, how to perform, how to go out there and 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 work these characters that they come up with, you know. So I thank God that I had the opportunity to do all this stuff just to help these younger people because you know I'm fifty, almost fifty two years old. So you know uh, I I still wrestle, I still do shows. You understand, but you know. Uh, my whole passion now is teaching people how to live their dream and be a good professional wrestler. I'm not just in this business to take people's money. You know, I, I don't rob people, man, because my name is on that label and you go out in the world and, you know, and, and you're out there in that ring and people looking at you and they ask you who trains you and, you, you know, and if you suck, my goodness, I don't want nobody to look, you know, <laughs> I don't want that coming back on me. You follow me so far? So, you know, I try to teach the best I can, you know, to people that come to me and they get their money's worth, you see. But no, uh, I, 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 yes, I've learned a lot by just standing out there looking at, you know, other guys wrestle as a bodyguard, talking to Harley Race, <laughs> a veteran of, of this business has been in here for so many, so many years, riding up and down the highway, telling stories. That stuff, you know, helped me in my career, too. You know, and then I'm passing down some of the knowledge to a lot of my students that I teach. So it all works out, to you know, for the good, to be honest with you. In your opinion, who do you think you have the best chemistry with as far as a bodyguard goes? Who are you bodyguarding that you think work the best on screen? Well, you know, that's a good question. Um, you know, uh, you know, me and Shane... Uh, uh, D uh, Douglas, we worked good together as, uh, I, I did good with, as his bodyguard. We clicked, you know, we clicked real well. And me and Triple H clicked for the short time that we had. And, um, uh, you know, pretty much, I mean, you know, that, that was, that was, that was pretty much about it, you know. Um, yeah, that's about it. Now, on the flip side of that, as far as wrestling goes, which opponent do you have that you felt like you had the best chemistry with in the ring? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, me and the Undertaker had good chemistry. Uh, too bad that angle didn't last long. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, I had good chemistry with uh, Kurt, Kurt Henning, Lord rest his soul. He was, we had good chemistry. Brad, uh, Brad Armstrong. We we worked. We had good chemistry. I mean, you know, I had most pretty much most of the guys that I've worked. You know, some you know some of them were pretty simple. Some of them were pretty easy to work with. 
I mean, you know, some of them were like pulling teeth, but you know, most of the time, you know, the guys were pretty, pretty big business like. They all took business. I really didn't have that many uh, trouble with too many guys. To be honest with you. Well, uh, total protection, Mister Hughes. I want to make sure we have plenty of time for you to talk about all of your. Uh, social media and your upcoming shows and your school, anything else you want to plug. So anything you would like to say to the listeners, plug everything that you would like to plug. Why don't you go ahead and do that? Thank you. I appreciate that. First of all, folks, uh, I am uh, a trainer. I am a WWE superstar. I still am. You know, people say former, but, you know, you're always going to be a, a superstar of each company you work for. And I am a trainer of superstars. I do know how to teach you how to wrestle. Okay. Um, um, yes, I have my own school. You can, the address is, uh, 640, uh, Highway 138 Southwest. It's in Riverdale, Georgia. The phone number is 404-664-2827. We're open from 5 till 8.30 in the evening, Monday through Thursday. And, uh, you know, Mr. Hughes, the bull.com is the email and you can Facebook me at Curtis Hughes. And, uh, you know, if you're interested in becoming a good professional wrestler, like a lot of the thousands of guys I've trained and a couple of WWE superstars that are on TV right now, uh, two are on SmackDown, Heath Slater and Apollo Crews. And of course, I got one over here, Moose over in TNA. And of course, you know, I train girls too, women. Uh, Kiera Hogan is one of my prized lady pupils that, uh, you know, getting looked at and, you know, you know, she does Booker T shows and things like that. So if you're a woman and you want to be a professional wrestler, I'll train you too. So, you know, if you're interested in being a professional wrestler and you want to learn from one of the best trainers in the world, you know, give us to use a call also too. I'm available for bookings. You can reach me at with that information I gave you earlier. Uh, I do seminars, wrestling seminars. So if you're interested in doing a wrestling seminar where I come to whatever town, city you're at, uh, it can be one day, two day, three days, whatever you prefer. And, uh, you, you know, set up something where guys can come and I can take them through a clinic and explain the game and the whole nine yards. And I guarantee you, you definitely get your money's worth because I'm not the type of guy that just takes people money. I want to see results when I leave your life. Okay. So. Um, if you're interested, just get, just get back with me. I thank you guys for, uh, you know, giving me a holler and, uh, you know, and going through my life and, uh, giving you some of this wisdom that I created through the years and, uh, you know, hope to, uh, talk to you guys again. Well, total protection, Mr. Hughes. It was our pleasure to have you here on the Undisputed Wrestling Show on the Angry Marks Podcast Network. Absolute pleasure. Always enjoyed your work, and I wish you the best of luck as you continue on with your school. You're doing a quality job training this new crop of wrestlers. Thank you very much. God bless. Killer Kev, that was pretty tremendous. That was a great interview with Mr. Hughes. I thank him very much for taking a few minutes to, out of his day to come talk with us. Absolutely. A lot of people just... In the last few weeks, uh, being reminded that Mr. Hughes is still contributing to this business because you hear WWE commentators constantly talking about Apollo Crews being trained by Mr. Hughes. So it's good he's getting his name out there uh, by the um, WWE. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I have to correct you there. It's Apollo Creed. No, no, no. It's Crews. We, we covered this. Creed was the movie that Daniel Bryan had just watched when he made that error. By, he by, talked to booted on SmackDown something or other, the post show. By, by God, it's Creed. And if anybody like a two-time world heavyweight champion like The Miz knows anything, he knows who his people are. I'm going to have to dispute it because Apollo Creed was killed by a Russian. I know because in the movie Creed, they referenced it, and Felicia Rashad would never say anything that was not accurate. Hmm. 
Alicia Rashad, America's Mom, or The Miz, America's Most Popular Hollywood Actor Ever? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. She's America's Mom, and why would she lead us astray? Why would The Miz lead us astray? He is well, a he is a straight shooter, and yeah, he has and he do has. Do you really trust a MTV reality show veteran like The Miz when he's been partying for the last fifteen years on those MTV reunion specials, and they give him the cheap champagne? He's guzzling. It, it probably killed a few of his brain cells. Come on, the man is married to the most beautiful woman in two countries. What happened to the rest of the countries that aren't legally married? Well, I have no idea if she graces, even graces the rest of those countries, but... be interesting to see her passport. Might, possibly. We need it. We need to get them booked. Rick Craig, where are you at? When are you going to get Marie Soule booked on our show? Yeah, and not one of those deals where she's supposed to wrestle Cameron Starr and then nothing ever happens. Get her on this show so we can ask why she's only... Legally married in two countries, apparently. <laughs> and if it helps, I am fully licensed to perform sports entertainment weddings. Also, funerals and baptisms. There we go. Although, I don't think that's going to be too much of a problem. Well, you never know. So, wh- while we're at it, I have to apologize, ladies and gentlemen. I know you were expecting to hear uh, Joseph Schwartz jump in there and ask a few questions. He's having some technology problems with his new phone. Um, so he'll try to get back on with us later on in the show. So since we've got a few minutes before our next guest will be calling in, Mr. Sign Guy, how was your weekend? Uh, not too bad. It was a little bit warm. Uh, I was at uh, the SCW show in Bremerton, Washington. The temperature at the time of the main event was a brisk 102 degrees. Uh B-Boy from Lucha Underground was the special guest star of the show. He wrestled a singles match with Von Hess, and then that kind of morphed into a tag team match where they ended up teaming up against Slum America. Uh, main event was Ian Bear versus Victor I. Price. Very hard-hitting affair. Uh, next night, uh, I had the week off at NWA blue collar, but apparently a whole bunch of things happened. We had a retirement from one of the uh, cornerstones of the Pacific Northwest wrestling community, Dave Havoc Hollenbeck. Uh, he took his wrestling shoes off in the middle of the ring, signifying retirement. Uh, I have not gotten in on the pool on how long that lasts just yet, but I will. And uh, a couple of injuries, uh, young Kane Jaden, lost his NWA Blue Collar Wrestling Heavyweight title and apparently broke his hand in the process. And then the NWA Pacific Northwest Tag Team Champion Cole Holder Darkness broke his leg pretty horrifically. He's going to be out six months after surgery to put in a rod and some screws. So... A lot of crazy things going on in the Northwest this past week. Yeah, it sounds like it. Um, my weekend was pretty quiet around here. I, I got to spend a, a lot of time watching a lot of wrestling this weekend. Um, I got to pick up on the New Japan J-Cup tournament uh, early Saturday morning. Um Friday, well, I guess you could start Friday evening with, with the Ring of Honor show. Um, early Saturday morning, you had New Japan J-Cup. Uh, Saturday evening, you had NXT uh, TakeOver Brooklyn 2. And then uh, Sunday, you had SummerSlam. And, and, and that was a lot of action. Let me tell you if, you, if you, if you, if anybody out there missed any of this wrestling action, shame on you because most of it was pretty good. A lot going on. It looks like a lot of promotions are trying to do what they have been doing at WrestleMania and latch on to SummerSlam and make a week-long wrestling festival wherever SummerSlam is. You have the Evolve shows, uh, Ring of Honor running their pay-per-view, not where SummerSlam was, but still running at the same week. Uh, you had 
lots of independent shows in and around the New York area that uh, are basically piggybacking off of SummerSlam, sort of like when they do for WrestleMania, a Tier 1 wrestling, uh, Warriors of Wrestling, a lot of the independent groups running. So there's a lot of wrestling this last week. So it looks like they have established SummerSlam as sort of a uh, mid Waypoint WrestleMania. And you have WrestleMania a few months, SummerSlam, the big, huge wrestling week, and then uh, take a couple of months off and then gear up to make the build to WrestleMania. Yeah, um, and then and then of course I I completely forgot about this because I didn't see the show at all. And personally, I don't have any interest in this show. Uh, but UFC 202 was this weekend as well. Um, but you know, wasn't a big deal to me because of some of the antics that are going on, but definitely a big deal in the sport, sports and sports entertainment world. Absolutely. From from what I understand, uh, Conor McGregor versus Nate Diaz is already being labeled an instant classic and possibly one of the best MMA fights in the history of UFC. I think it's going to be interesting for glove up or shut up this week when they cover that. Oh, yeah. They're... they're Stevie J and Peter H. are definitely going to be covering that and a lot more happening in the world of mixed martial arts as well. Um, so what what wrestling did you get to see that you weren't personally attending to? Uh, I saw uh, most of the SCW card I was at, and then I also watched the uh, SummerSlam from start to finish. I watched a couple of episodes of the Cruiserweight Classic, I'm trying to catch up on that. I'm nearly caught up. And then I was able to catch uh, Monday Night Raw. Uh, not a lot outside of that, unfortunately, but I'm going to try to catch up with some of those shows. What's been your favorite match so far in the Cruiserweight Classic? So far, I would say, hmm, that's an inter- I, some of them I have mixed feelings on, too. But I would say probably probably Cedric Alexander's first match. You know, I had a funny feeling you were going to mention that. I don't know. I don't know why. I, I just figured that th- th- that was probably going to be a match that you really liked. Per- personally, my favorite match so far has been uh, Tommaso Ciampa and Johnny Gargano. That was that's that's next on my dock. That episode is next to play. That 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 match to me has been the hardest hitting match. Um, both physically and emotionally to me. Um, you know, it, it might be because I, I know a lot about uh, Mr. Ciampa, and I've, I've earnestly followed his career for, for quite a few years now. We've had him a, a guest a couple times on uh, Angry Marks, so love to give him again, but since he signed a WWE contract, I doubt that's going to happen anytime soon. But, you know, the, those things happen. But um, let, let me ask you, what are your thoughts on Jack Gallagher? I think he's very, very good. Um, I don't know if uh, he would transition into being a star for the main roster of WWE full-time or not, but I think this is going to make him a, a pretty good star if he were to go to, say, a New Japan or a Ring of Honor or even just a major independent from the North American, European, and Asian communities. Now, definitely, te- he, he is definitely t- a great technical wrestler. What do you think about the character? See, that's what I like about wrestling is when you have a character and you combine that with the wrestling and you sort of make a blend of the two as part of the overall presentation. So anytime someone does that, I generally gear towards enjoying it. It's the... the The Gallagher character to me is is really a unique blend because on one hand, you you know, WWE has definitely pushed him as a guy you like and and they pushed him and pushed him and pushed him so hard as a baby face. But the more they did it, the more I just saw this this guy just kind of comes off as really smug, almost like an asshole that everybody likes. And I hate it. But because I hate it, I love the way they've done this character. Yeah, if, absolutely. If, and, I mean, uh, if that makes any sense? It does, it does. Now, another person I think uh, has 
done really well on that. And Zach Sabre Jr., I think he definitely should be a star in the next couple of years somewhere stateside. Yeah, I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, he are, It's already been announced. Uh, he's turned down a WWE contract. Um, it seems to me more like he, he is more poised to hit mega stardom in the UK than than maybe ready to uh, move on to, to a career in the U.S. That's entirely possible and nothing wrong with that. And a lot of people make careers overseas and do very well. Uh, people like uh, Kenny Omega, much bigger star in Japan than the United States, and he just sort of fills time when he's in the United States, really. But he, he's a pretty big star in Japan, so there's nothing wrong with that. No, nothing wrong with that at all. Um, speaking of Kenny Omega, um, winner of the, this year's um, G1 Climax Tournament, the first Westerner to ever win the tournament. Well, there you go. Like I said, he, he's made his name out there. Uh, didn't really work out for him stateside as far as being a really big star, but once he got to Japan, I think uh, he got – a lot of notoriety there, and I think that made him a bigger star when he does come to the United States. Yes, and I, I am keenly anticipating him coming over, either working for another independent promotion or possibly with... Uh, I am really looking forward to see if New Japan is ever going to pull the trigger and start having an annual West Coast tour. Well, you know, why not? I'm on the West Coast. I'd watch it. I'd watch, you know, definitely watch it, definitely go to it. I, I think there is a very vast untapped audience there for New Japan to start taking advantage of. Well, you know, just up here in Seattle, one of the most popular baseball players ever out of the Mariners organization was Ichiro, and it was in large part because there is a very, very large Japanese population living in the Seattle area, and they tend to very much support and follow Japanese nationals that come to the United States and participate in professional athletics. So I think something like that would definitely be supported uh, like here in Seattle, down in Los Angeles. There's a big Japanese community, uh, San Francisco area. So I think that would definitely be a success for them. Absolutely. I agree with that. Uh all right, it is now top of the hour, and we are currently joined on the line by our next guest. Uh, would you like to give him the introduction, Mr. Sign Guy? We have with us one of the top independent professional wrestlers in the Midwest today. We have with us Jack Thriller. Mr. Thriller, welcome to the Undisputed Wrestling Show here on the Angry Marks Podcast Network. Well, hey, guys. Thanks for having me. I uh, appreciate it. Since uh, we've not talked to you here on this show before, Mr. Thriller, we're going to ask what we normally do to start off. What got you into the business of professional wrestling? Oh, um, well, all right. Well, I've always, I've always, you know, the cliche, I've watched it as a kid and all that. When I was had a job, a summer job between college, I uh, had a friend that wanted to be a pro wrestler. He's a big old guy and he needed and he got a hold of dan the b severin and they said hey it's better to come in pairs so i was like i don't think i can do it and he was like no come with me i'll pay for your first month and that was 15 years later he lasted about three months and i i'm still doing it that is the long short of it <laughs> no more romance to it <laughs> had you had anything in your background as far as athletics or drama that prepared you for professional wrestling or was professional wrestling what you wanted to do and you focused strictly on that well um like i said um i guess no i played played sports as as a young man uh you know in high school and stuff i ran and i was active so i've always been like a uh, fleet of foot um, no dramatics, you know, no any, no drama and stuff like that. No acting classes. Uh, I've, I'm, I'm known to cut it up a little bit, <laughs> but other than that, yeah, no, nothing really prepared me. And pro wrestling, like I said, wasn't. I didn't think I could do it. I was kind of coerced into it by a friend of mine who, um, being that I'm such a tight ass, paid for my first, my first month of training. 
That's the only reason why I did it. And then I got there, and I was like, wow, I kind of like this. Structure is athleticism. Uh, no one's no one's really picking on me. This is kind of cool because I'm blending in. You know, I'm doing the squats and the bullshit like that and push-ups where my friend was obese, and he couldn't do it. He, he didn't realize the the amount of gall it takes to become a become a professional wrestler. Uh, just even at the early stages of learning your bumps and uh, being able to get ring shape and stuff. So, uh, Dan Severn had pretty pretty grueling uh, first six weeks, and then then you didn't see him for about a year. But the first six weeks, it was it was crazy. You just did squats and you did Hindu push-ups, and then you did then you wrestled. You shoot wrestled with each other until oh until you puked or or whatever it was it was grueling i see why now looking back why he didn't make it uh, as because i don't think he was prepared i think he thought pro wrestling was dramatics and raw and it is but you still gotta you still gotta be able to hang in there now of course in wrestling in the last say 20 years or so there's been a bigger emphasis on people that are in shape have a certain look uh, a lot of focus on uh, dietary and uh, conditioning requirements needed to make it. But throughout wrestling history, there were a lot of very large men that you wouldn't look at and necessarily think professional athlete, but they had very long, very successful wrestling careers. What do you think the difference is as far as what the mindset was then when larger people that weren't necessarily looked at as athletes could make it in professional wrestling and succeed versus today where you don't really see the big 450-pound guys that aren't the freaks of nature athletically like a Congo Kong. Uh, they don't generally get a chance. Well, I, I think there's there's many factors to it. There's... um. Back then, uh, it was coming off the cusp of defense of the business. So if you had Bruto the Savage come to your town, he weighed 500 pounds, the average Joe was not going to try him. And if they did, he'd probably lose. Um, so that, that, that was one of the reasons why they, uh, a lot of larger than life care, larger than life, um, bodies were in there because it, it kept the average Joe from thinking they can do it. Now you have all these super, super fit, um, combat athletes that that's all they do is train and do that so in turn it's the same way now because you may they, their stature may be smaller but their veracity is 500 times the output of any average joe so I, for i have seemed to lost a little of the focus of the question you want to know why big guys don't have a shot i just don't think that people per se and this is nothing against big jolly green giant guys per se believe that they in any way, shape, or form are endangered by anybody obese. Now, that's not saying that, like, Kong, Kongo Kong is an athlete. Samoa Joe, an athlete. These guys, and all the guys that made money back in the day were all linebackers, or this fucking guy took an axe, I'm sorry about the swear word, this guy took an axe and cut down trees. They were all men, like, so, the fat boys today aren't men. They're fat boys, and that's why no fat people that are just obese seven footers will make it in this business because it, it's, it's hard knocks back in the day. They were men, man. You just didn't, there was no TV and video games and any of that nonsense. Yeah. If they were obese, but they still had a night, they still were breaking bricks or some shit. Yeah. No, the fat boys today, that's why they don't make it unless they're an athlete. And then you know who they are. Now on the flip side of that, when you go back, say, 30 years ago, the smaller cruiserweight wrestlers were not in vogue. You had the occasional breakout star like a Ricky Morton, but by and large, smaller guys were just eaten up on television to feed for the stars. Now, WWE presenting a cruiserweight classic that seems like it's pretty successful for them. You've seen a lot of smaller guys main event for the larger companies now. What do you think it is that makes people look differently at the smaller wrestlers now as opposed to 
say, 30 years ago. Well, okay, look at the look at the large guys 30 years ago. There were there were guys that were either they were so gassed out that they could barely do anything. Like I mean, realistically, they could pick heavy weights up and all that shit. But they were so gassed out, their movability, their flair was so like wanting. With the cruiserweights now, and and it solely results around the MMA too. I think has a lot to do with this upshot uptick of badass because Uriah Favor is 132 pounds but he will own most 200 pound men like it's just it's just to show like this is this is those guys are dangerous and and I think that is translating with the cruiserweights because did you I mean I've been watching the cruiserweight classic and if anybody says that these people are small or whatever other than they're just fools these are all athletes I think times are changing and it's not, it's not that. I mean, there's still room for big giant men. God, I mean, look at Brock Lesnar. But once again, I retort with, he's an athlete. Um, what big fat guys are even out there anymore? And what, and you know, nobody. There's no giant, giant fat guys anymore. And the last big guy I knew about was the Highlander. And he was, and that was when I was, uh, he was an indie guy up here. <laughs> so, I don't know. I, uh, I think the, I think the people are being more open to cruiserweights. Because they, there is an athleticism to it that is awe-inspiring, opposed to sort of lumping around the ring, ba-boom, ba-boom, roar. Well, that's cool. You need one match of that, but then I wanted to see a bunch of other trapeze addicts and stuff like that. So I think that's what's happening. I think the flavor is changing. Now, I've often said that wrestling is much like the circus where they feed you a stream of various acts. Uh, now in wrestling, it's not as varied. You have the big power guys that seem to square off, and then you have the smaller cruiserweights. There's not a lot in between. Do you think that that might be something that wrestling needs to eventually get back to, or do you think that, by and large, the way things are presented in the modern era is the way to go? Are you uh, okay? So are we talking on uh, television or indies? Because indies, I see it, and the best shows I watch on the indies are the ones with the variety act, the trapeze act, the open, the tag team match, the ha ha match. Like these are these are things that I really enjoy, and I've been really luckily the last like five or at least six shows I've been I've had a nice variety. Television, you're we're trying to appeal to like 12 million people, so I I think the variety is is there. Um, especially with the, the brands and the different programs, because if you want to see more like uh, traditional indie, re- uh, traditional TV wrestling from like the, the storytelling wise, not uh, not actual um, performance wise, but they, they have a nice TV format from like the 80s on NXT. You know, you should, vignettes, get in the ring, do the business vignette. You know, like that. That's my I, I love that stuff. Um, if you want to see more of a show business kind of like a uh, television program, yeah, Raw does it. But then you've got you to remember the the pay-per-views always pay off. I don't care what anybody says. They're always paying off. They give you a little bit of everything, even on the pay-per-views. Girls, the ha-ha. Even, you know, they're steering clear of the, the crazy blood and hardcore, but then you get SummerSlam, you get all this crazy, crazy jazz at the end. You're like, wow, okay. So I think we're getting a variety act. I just don't think it is as in depth as we'd like it to see. You know, you don't have a Manitar, and then you don't have the the Rocker, and then you don't have a Papa Shen. Like it's not all as crazy, like unreal characters. But I think we're getting. I think there's still a variety that is played down. But on the Indies, though, that is where the shows do the best, as when it's complete variety act. So that's my opinion on the whole deal. TV, yeah, I think it's variety right now. Not as much as it it, it has been, and I don't think it needs to go too much more. But it could tweak it a little bit. But on the indies, variety needs to happen, and it needs to be like it needs to be like huge variety acts. That's my opinion on on that. <laughs> uh, just the other day in New York, there was a very very controversial moment where the New York Athletic Commission stepped in and stopped a intergender match temporarily. Uh, they eventually could not produce in the rec- in the rule book where there is a statute saying that intergender matches were illegal in the state of New York. The match eventually happened. It was pretty big news coming out of the weekend. 
What are your thoughts on intergender matches in general, and do you think the athletic commissions should regulate such? No, I don't. I I think athletic commissions and professional wrestling is a joke. Personally, um, where where is this? Who gets the money? Where it benefits? It's all this figurehead. I mean, I mean, it's probably a different podcast. My conspiracy theory on taxation and all that bullshit. Ah. Uh, no, I don't think the, the athletic commission should be stepping in on anything. I, I, with the very exception of blood, I am not a blood guy. Um, I'm not anti-blood, but I think there is, should be some some oversight. Not, an, I mean, then then again, I could be talked out of it. So the athletic commission should not be involved in in realistically an intergender professional wrestling contest. Being that. Oof, we all know what it's what's up. Now, on intergender wrestling, I think it has its place. I think it does, as we were talking, especially on the indies. I um, I do not think it has its place quite yet, unless it's a sideshow act on television. Um, the Amazing Kong, yes, she could beat up a couple, a couple tiny dudes for a for a for a, for something. I just don't think that uh, the the 12 million or 10 million people, the big world, the eight year olds that that just randomly tune in with the neurotic mother turns on and watches uh, John Cena lariat uh, Nikki Bella's head off. I don't think they're going to be ready for that. Now, however, on the Indies, that spice of life that brings variety to your show. Um, I am very pro, very pro intergender matches and not stupid. Stupid intergender matches where it's like the guy is going to be all either oversexed or he's not going to sell for the broad because she's a broad. Let's get out there and tell a great story. That that's where the challenge comes in, and that's where the artist should want to come out. That not this like well in real life I can't take it. You know, nah, get the fuck out of here. On the indie show, indie show we need spice life, the cannonball act, the trapeze act, the, the dude that sticks his line in the head. Yeah. I don't think it's ready for intergender wrestling on on a competitive level for TV because Lucha Underground gets a lot of negative feedback for having those chicks in there, and they I, I know it'd be even bigger scale on for the WWE. Now, you yourself personally, uh, do you do a lot of intergender matches, or have you done them earlier in your career? Yeah, I've done I've done quite quite a bit. I'm a I'm a progressive when it comes to um, indie wrestling. Um, I've uh, wrestled uh, Heidi Lovelace on several occasions. I have I value her as an athlete and a competitor and a professional wrestler. Um, and then Randy West, I've wrestled her on a couple of occasions. So I mean, I value. I mean, the, uh, Thunder Kitty. These these girls, I've been they're women. I'm sorry, that I've been in the ring with. Uh, I mean, I've I wouldn't tout them if I didn't feel that they were good um, and athletes. And I treat them as, as as a competitor, another artist. Like I don't I don't pussyfoot around anything or dance around and put baby gloves on them. I mean, no. I mean, these these women are competitors and they want to be treated as such. And I, I have value in them. There's 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 ladies out there that use the you know use the their advantages and then get out there, but they get exposed and they get put in the spot that they need to be put in. Um, you, you'll find out. You'll know who they are. The ones that get exposed that think they can wrestle and they just really can't, and they're just eye candy. And that's fine. I mean. There's guys out there that are just eye candy. Like they look great in a banana hammock, but can't can't do anything other than that. So I think there's I think yes, I'm very progressive progressive when it comes to in, uh, intergender wrestling. And I'm very confident that the three ladies you named specifically can knock out vast majority of independent men. <laughs> well, they're 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 talented for sure. Um, I mean, I, I can go down a laundry list of uh, women that I value as, as as their competitiveness in the ring. I mean, you, you know, and especially the three, that's the three I bring up because they're the ones that are on the circuit the most with me that I see. You touched on the fact that you're not a big fan of blood and professional wrestling. On the independence, it, in my opinion, it goes as far as individual companies, how they feel about blood. Some companies are fairly liberal with it. Some of it try to not have any at all on their shows. Right. Some shows will use it you know, sparingly in a certain type of match or a certain type of feud. 
do you think that there is a place for blood and do you personally yourself uh find yourself all right with it in certain situations or is it something that you'd rather not do at all on independence? Okay, I I, I mean, you're not going to get... I've been hit open or busted open and that shit happens, but I'm not, I don't think I, as an artist, would ever go that, that route, um, even in the storyline. However, I think there is room for it. I, I, I know there's room for it on the indie level. Um, there's there's uh, niche markets and then there's like... the I'm... I'm very pro deathmatch wrestling. I'm very pro that kind of wrestling. I when I mean blood and gut, I don't I don't want you know like we're in front of like 14 children and you're going out there and you're going to bleed. Like what in the WTF? However, if you're booking a death match, let's let's get that out there. But I think there and then that's where I was a little torn. I think there should be a little oversight with all the bloodborne pathogens, but then again, we're adults and and it's you're not being you're not being pointed a gun at you to go out there and do that kind of stuff. So these are all choices made. And then, then, then there's a whole debate whether it's out of the person's hands, blah, 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 blah. But I think, in general, there needs to be, there, there's room for it, like the deathmatch wrestling tournaments. Um, and then if you have a, a variety act show, I like a little hardcore in there, but let's not do it. Like I said, it's it's all on your... It's all in your perception of your market, the people you're doing it from. If you're doing it in front of a birthday party of a bunch of 12-year-old kids, 10-year-old kids, you're going out there to bleed buckets and stab each other in the, light, in the head with a light tube, get the fuck out of here. Okay, that's stupid. All right. However, if you book a deathmatch tournament and you have feverishly 500 people that want to watch that, okay, well, let's get it. Let's get that shit done. That's not, that's not me. Not my flavor, but I get it. I love watching it. I'll consume as much as that, but I mean, it's just not my kind of art. Who would you say, deathmatch-wise, was your biggest inspiration as far as being a fan of that type of wrestling? Oh, wow. I, I, I've I been watching deathmatch wrestling since, like, you know, I got I go back to Tarzan Goto and all those guys and Anita, or, you know. So there's a lot of it. Here, the guys here that I, I enjoyed was Toby Klein, Necro. You, like, the the dudes I grew up watching that I got tapes from when I was, younger, like 18, 17 years old, you know, like go and get the King of the Death match tournament, IWA's King of the Death. So those guys are like dudes that enamored me. I was like, wow, watching some of this stuff. Like I went down, I saw I saw Necro get his elbow blowed up or whatever the hell it was, like ripped, his tricep ripped off in that spiderweb match. I was there. And then I watched Toby Klein hit him in the head with a VCR. And so, so those guys really made him like, wow, watch me. And then after getting to know them all, I actually, they, I don't know if they just, they thought I was an affable little turd or whatever, but I, I, I was quite fond of all those guys, Ian and, and, uh, Necro and Toby Klein and then Freak Show and Lane and all those guys. So Tondo was always too, Tony, you know, court, those guys were always, those guys were always the dudes I watched. Um, of course, that was the group, the, the, you know, the, the market, the IWA tapes I got. I didn't really trade outside of that until I was actively, you know, in pro wrestling. Then I started getting, um, you know, the IWCs, and then your your um, your Florida promotion was. It, it, so that that's what it was. So when I was a younger man, I it was the IWA guys that really had an influence on me. And then uh, subsequently, I went to IWA and then uh, performed. I think those guys, so like Ian Rotten, Necro, Toby Klein, guys like that. Years ago, there were wrestlers that in this era would be classified as deathmatch wrestlers or hardcore wrestlers. But back then, they didn't really classify them as such. You had guys like Abdullah the Butcher, Kevin Sullivan, Dusty Rhodes a lot of times. Were guys like that people you also would study? when you were doing that style of wrestling to try to see what they did and what would work and maybe not work as far as like, getting the crowd involved into what you were doing? Well, uh, those, the, the, not so much Abdullah, but like Dusty, I've, geez, I watched Dusty study hours of him. Uh, I never really, um, like the guys that made me watch it, the death match, the hardcore style. Yeah. Those are the guys that were, did it. The dudes that were just tough and fought, like, you know, like Brody and, uh, you know, the 
Terry Funk and guys that would just get crazy and fight, those guys were always cool, but I never considered them hardcore. So I always watched them for their, their, their ability to draw people to them and their ability to tell a story in the ring. I never really thought of those as hardcore guys. I just knew sometimes they got crazy. Hardcore is a niche product, and I think it needs it, it, it has to have its own standalone. And Abdullah, yes, he was hardcore, but it, once again, he just would just get bloody and fight. Whereas these guys are doing a, more of a stunt-based um, act, where you you have to fall through or get stabbed with or get you know what's flip. It's like a fifty-dollar match or twenty-dollar match they have or whatever. They, so I think well, to, to divide it is. It, it's with the vernacular of putting it all under hardcore, I think is a little, it does a little injustice to the, the acts that are doing it now and did it throughout the uh, mid nineties to two thousands and stuff because they were doing stunts. Whereas the other guys were using um, art, their art as in like crimson masks and stuff like that. And just being actually overly violent opposed to doing some of the more stunt based things. Like look at, look at 94 was in 94, 95, the, the Taipei death match, right? So the 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 Rottens fought each other and stabbed each other in the head and shit with glass on their hand. Like Brody, if he did, I never never saw any footage of that. He just started fighting, and then you would just bleed, and he'd hit you in the head with a bottle and bite you and shit. Where these guys actually had a legitimate stunt, or excuse me, a, a, a pretense to their match. Now, for your own personal career, what do you think as far as Tag teaming versus singles match. I know you you've done some tag teaming. Uh, you've done quite a bit of singles. Do you have a personal preference? Um, no. Uh, I I would say sing. Well, all right. See, that's this is a little tougher question. I I like both. And and all the tag team matches and six mans I've done where we actually had um, legs and room to actually achieve goals with our matches and not throw togethers. Not just like all right. Well, we're gonna put B in and Q together tonight, and they're going to wrestle F and J. Like, I don't, they don't care for that. But in the tag team matches that I had a legitimate partner where we had legitimate storyline and legs where we were telling stories with, I enjoy. And same with singles. It's, I guess it's whatever I can um, express myself and get some drive out of a match and not just one-offs. So I would think that my favorite, my, my best way to answer this question is my favorite match or the favorite thing for my to be involved is is anything that I'm able to express myself and be happy with if it's just something where I got to go out there and have a popcorn then yeah I I still have fun because god why would you do it if you don't have fun but where I have to think and challenge myself and that's in singles where I have to try to do three matches differently each time or in a tag match where I got to figure out how I'm going to be able to come back with this another match out of this without either A, looking like dog crap, or B, um, not delivering to the fans what they need? I don't know. That's a tough question. I like, I guess, the jealous part of me would say singles because I'm the show, the the ringmaster. But then the other part of me says the tag team because I like, I like some great tag team wrestling. It really does, it really is nice to see. Like, so I I didn't answer your question very well. I apologize for that one. (laughs) Oh, that's all right. Uh, Putting you on the spot, whom would you say is your top three best partners that you ever had? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> well, I really enjoyed, well, I'm going to do, I'm going to cheat a little bit, but I really enjoyed my prestige run that I did in Indianapolis for, uh, for um, Infinity Pro and then um, Strong Style Wrestling. So I really enjoyed that. So that's one. And then I also, for the short time down in IWA Mid South, I was with uh, Shane Mercer and Gary J, and we were the Ginger Snaps. That just made me laugh. We did a couple um, little stints. I really enjoyed that. So that's two. And then, oh Christ, I got Johnny Dynamo. I guess he was my he's my early partner about in 2005, 2006. We were the Wild Stallions together. We did all it. You know, we ran around Detroit and kind of did all that cool stuff back then. So then, that was my top three. For the people that are out there on the independent levels right now, I see out here in the Pacific Northwest not really a lot of understanding on how to merchandise yourself and how to make money at 
merchandising and really selling yourself in other ways besides just having the match. What do you see in your area as far as the comprehension of merchandising and being able to market yourself and make money at independent wrestling? It's well, to be honest, it's one of the hardest things. I, like when you break in, okay, this is this is how this is how awful it was, or excuse me, my perception of it was. When you break in, you get told not to do any of that shit. Don't talk yourself up. Like you got to be humble, you got to shut up and stuff like that, and you got to be quiet. And then get you a pitcher, you know, get you an eight by ten. Shut up. Now they're like, you need to now you get on the internet and then you put your match up and you talk about how good you are. Man, I tell you what. Back in the day, they'd have done that. People would have freaked out and sniffed you and stuff like that. They'd have got in there and called you a mark for yourself. So it's it's real challenging for me because I'm always I'm having all these conflicting stories. Where I see a lot of young guys now that do well in merchandise are the young guys that get social media, like Owen Travers. That dude gets it. Chase Matthews kind of gets it to an extent with his merchandise, but Owen Travers gets it. Like. He understands. He's got an Owen Travers network. He's always talking about all this new pictures he's going to have at the show. Like, he gets it. Now, he moved out to Vegas, but he's the guy that stands out. Drew Skills really gets merchandise. Uh, like, I, I understand. He really gets, get, he really sells himself well. I've never been able to do that. Like, the, the cutting the promo on the internet thing is so challenging for me. Like, I, I, I get so mad at myself that I can't just go through it because I'm over analytical. And then I get like, geez, what? Um, <laughs> for example, Severin would call me a mark over myself. He'd be like, what are you doing? <laughs> you're supposed to do that show. You know, and you're like, ah, oh, dang. And you hear you get all these conflicted messages. So, in my opinion, the guys who are really good at merchandise right now are younger guys that are being taught by guys that are progressive into the business, that are teaching them to mar- merchandise themselves, not sticking to the old, heels don't go out and say anything. Like, if you're being taught like that, you're always going to struggle at merchandising. People that teach you to brand yourself and treat treat yourself as if you're the Patriots or the Green Bay Packers, those are the guys that are doing really good with merchandise. And there's very few, there's few of them out here, but it's coming along. I'm teaching all the young guys that I know, that that's what they need to do. You need to brand yourself as like the Patriots. Not everybody likes the New England Patriots, but people do. And it's hard for me. I can't do it very well. But the guys I'm training are doing it better. And and then that's good because then they'll be able to teach guys to do it even better. And then hopefully here it'll get it'll get weaned out that it's old school mentality that heels don't go out. And I know, I would, okay, don't get me wrong. I don't want the guy that just cuts some dude's head off in the ring, come out there and pick up kids and kiss them on the forehead to sell this flea market shit that he's got at his table. But what I'm getting at is that we should all be branding ourselves. Even if you're a villain, if you're, you've got to get out there and get your brand out there to be seen. So hopefully in another year or so, maybe two, it'll get weaned out with some of these new guys that are coming up and they'll be able to, We'll start seeing some real positive brands, and you'll start being able to see some real organic individuals come out. And I think with branding and being hip to your cause of selling things and trying to connect, find something that somebody will take away from the show to have a memory, that comes with also developing your character. And so, ipso facto, green guys will be a little bad at it, but eventually they'll get their niche, just like everybody gets their niche on how the. I mean, excuse me. Good artists will always get their niche on how to um, present themselves in the ring, and then therefore it should transcend uh, into the merchandise tables. Hopefully, knock on wood, right? Exactly. Speaking of Drew Skills, the best of Drew Skills 2015 DVD available <laughs> soon for purchase. Ooh. <laughs> Just gonna throw it out there. Well, good. He will too uh, on several occasions. I think he texts me that some uh, the other day. I guess just just ca- hey Jeff, just case you didn't know, my best of DVDs coming out. My hair looks luxurious. Uh-huh. <laughs> I like Drew. He he is rocking with the best. Yep, you're rocking with the best. Uh, he's one of my top uh, one of my top favorite guys because he always he always takes time. 
you can look in a locker room. I don't know, like, how familiarized you are, like, in depth in that. But, like, going into a locker room, especially a new locker room, and you sit back and you just kind of watch. Uh, I'm at a little advantage because people, you know, they shake my hand and they're like, oh, hi, Jack. And then we go out and then they just kind of let me settle, right? And so I can just observe. And then you can look back and to see what's going on. And Drew Skills has always been one of those dudes that sits in the locker room and people will, you know, either A, come up to ask him, and then I have seen him just go up to just random green dudes while he hears them calling their match and, and stops them and, and gives them honest, heart, like not just like dog on them, like teach them the right way. And there's not very many, there weren't any any of those dudes when I was coming up, man. Everybody kept their shit to themselves. They didn't know you, you weren't allowed in. Now it seems to be that's the, it's becoming completely the opposite of that. And I mean, and that's good. That's that's that breeds better wrestlers. That breeds better um, territories, and more fans will come. Uh, it needs to happen more. And Drew's one of those guys that I always, I always give an Iggy to. I think he's a pretty good dude. Now, it's also very important in the locker room if you're in there with Drew Skills to not be sucking. Did you ever get the message that your match be sucking? Well, no, my match is. Ain't been sucking since about 2006. So, <laughs> hey, I do all right. I've heard Drew don't be sucking story before, and, and I just chuckle at him because Drew's a he is a bear, but the 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 pretense of cuddly always comes first. But there's still bear in the title. Now, for your own personal career so far, I know you talked about uh, training wrestlers. Have you ever personally? thought of opening up your own company at some point in time uh no i've 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 done shows before uh, and i don't i i know i'm good i'm uh quite happy with the all the involvement i have and at some point maybe i would even just settle down and be just a guy that teaches but that that's <laughs> that would be the extent i would not uh do my own my own promotion no now, is there any other aspect in the business which you have not performed that you think you might be interested in down the line? Mm. Well, uh, not pretty much. I mean, to the level that I could can do, I've done all. Like I've I've done commentary on DVDs. I've I've refed early in life. Uh, you know, I've done the tag teams, singles. Uh, I, well, I don't even know what else there is. I've, oh, I book shows. Like, I, you know, like, figure out cool little storylines. I, I've did shows before. I, like, put on my own shows. So, yeah, I, I've, I'm, yeah, I've pretty much dabbled in everything outside of the television aspect. Like, I've never I've produced a TV show or cut, you know, film or any of that crap. But I've done a lot with the, the, the local indie stuff that I can possibly do. When you did commentary, was that something that you found yourself enjoying, or was that something that is just another day at the office? You didn't really have any passion for that aspect. Well, I'll tell you what, I've done it three times, and when if you to do it right, it's it's hard. Um, uh, the first time I did it, I had a good time. I just was out there rambling, you know, and then listening back to it. That's what it sounds like. Somebody let the dumb punch drunk wrestler ramble on the commentary. And then the second time I did it, I tried to just um, stick to the points, and then it, if I found myself just stalling and sound like dead air, so that I didn't like it. And then the last one, I was with a real color guy, or excuse me, a real um, uh, play-by-play guy, and he was like, "Stop telling jokes." And then I said, "So I'm uh, not very good at it, and it, and it definitely doesn't appeal to me to be try to be better at it." Speaking of punch drunk, concussions have been sort of a big topic in wrestling in the last few years since medical science is learning a lot more about them and the long-term effects. What's your opinion on concussions as it relates to independent professional wrestling, and do you think that there's anything that can be or should be done for concussions? To stop them, I don't, you're not, you're not, and we're alive. We use our bodies to tell stories. We're going to have there is a chance of concussion. No, cha- no headshots with steel chairs. 
that would probably be that would be um a start um other than that you're you could turn down the complexity of some of these bumps that you could you could avoid doing and just do something flat would um would probably still invoke the same response uh and other than that like it, it, I like what the WWDE does with all their green guys. They put them in uh, in shock helmets and stuff like that. That's cool because we didn't, I mean, you bang the shit out of your head the first year of pro wrestling training and all that. Like, you don't do it every day, but, like, you'll, like, once you get the hang of it, chin to chest, chin to chest, and eventually you'll forget the bang. You know, it happens. So I like that. that. That's a cool aspect of it. But other than that, I don't really know what you can do. Um, other than what they already do on television, no pile drivers and none of that shit, no headshots. Um, and I, I personally, there should be no, no effing chair shots to the head. I mean, you're out your mind. You, you don't pay me enough to get hit in the head with a chair. I'll run into it in the corner if you set it up, but that's about it. Um, so maybe those two things would probably be the only real logical. I mean, anytime somebody's throwing live rounds at you when you're sticking your chin out, those those guys are assholes. I mean, that will help. Uh, I don't. Um, other than that, your hands are pretty much tied when it comes to the concussions on that. I mean, we can be safe and sound. I mean, as I just said, there's a lot of stuff we're doing right now that is to be safe to prevent um, concussions. What is the craziest thing that? someone had wanted you to do in a match that you refused to do? Hmm. Well, I mean, I I didn't... I was asked to do color a couple times, and I've always refused. Uh, craziest? I don't get crazy. Like, I don't, I don't get that kind of... I get, go do your match, thriller, because I have a, you know... I don't get crazy, astute, crazy ideas. I think I was presented a scaffold match one time, and I I scoffed it off, and I don't know if the promoter was serious. I was like, ha-ha, no. So I don't know if they were really serious about it, but um, I guess just just color. I don't do color. That would be it. All right. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have any cool stories like that. So nobody wanted you to dive off the top of an 18-wheeler onto the cement that's wrapped in barbed wire after they lit it on fire? <laughs> no. Now, of course, I would don't think I'd ever be in that situation of a match either. Though I wouldn't be on the grand stage of the of, of the because that's the spectacle. That's the high one of the higher ends of the death matches, right? It'd be like it'd be like if I got to put on like a, a the Super Eight ECWA Super Eight or TPIs, and then I was like, well, I'm not doing a, a 20 minute match. I'm only doing a five minute or like if, you're like what? Okay, this, so if you get to the the blender match, the hardcore death match tournament, the mecca. <laughs> And you're good, and you're in, you know, in a, in a pristine position. You would know that going into it. It wouldn't be sprung on you that day. Hey, we're going to jump off that into that today. Oh, and by the way, we only sold 15 tickets. Like <laughs> a little perspective. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Yeah, no, pass. And hopefully, you wouldn't kick out at two after the dive off the 18 wheeler onto the cement wrapped in barbed wire after it set on fire. Well, I mean, what are you going? Where are you going from there? Like. A back body drop out of the ring into a um, a board of uh, broken beer bottles and rat traps that have uh, uh, cactuses in it. That's pretty ending. You can end with that too. I've seen that. True. Although a lot of people would go with the Oklahoma roll right in the middle for the three after that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Or as a uh, 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 small package. <laughs> exactly. Well, we're getting towards the end, so if there's anything you would like to say to the listeners, plug and promote all of your upcoming shows, your social media links, your merchandise, anything you have going on, take it away. All right. Well, um, you can reach me on Twitter at Jack Thriller, uh 9 I have Facebook at just uh, Jack Thriller, and then I... Have upcoming shows. We'll be in the Detroit area on September 2nd in Melvindale at Pro Wrestling All Stars. Uh, I will be facing opponent two to be determined. <laughs> I hate to be determined. Uh, just, sorry. And then uh, September RCW is running FWF. Uh, fun- RCW is re- uh, 
I don't know what RCW stands for. I just know it's RCW. Ah, I hope he's not listening. FWF is uh, Funkified Wrestling. They're out of uh, Warsaw, Indiana. Uh, other than that, man, yeah, just catch me on Jack Thriller. I keep it all up to date. My Twitter's always up to date. Uh, that's it. I don't have Snapchat or Tinder or any of that shit. All right. Well, uh, sure. Jack Thriller, thank you very much for being on the Undisputed Wrestling Show here on the Angry Mark Podcast Network. Great talking to you. And hopefully you'll pick up a copy or two of the best of Drew Skills 2015. Yeah, I already got. He's trying to send me one, but he's sending it postage due, and I keep sending it back to him. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for being with us. Hopefully we'll get a chance to do it again down the line. Yeah, buddy. Thanks for having me. All right. Yeah. Killer Cab, another great interview. A very good interview from Mr. Jack Thriller. Some might say it was thrilling. Indeed. Well, Killer Kev, you want to tell the listeners what they got going on this week here on the Angry Marks Podcast Network so they can make plans to find their favorite shows? Well, hopefully here in a few minutes we're going to be recording this week's episode of The Raw Reaction. Unfortunately, we couldn't get that done last night due to some technical issues, so we're hoping to get that done tonight. Uh, tomorrow night will be a new episode of Glove Up or Shove Up with Stevie J and Peter H. covering everything in mixed martial arts. Thursday night, we will have Thursday night AMP where Stevie J gets to come back with Jason Harland, a.k.a. The Great Sudoku, and Abby Arthur to cover everything in professional wrestling. And then after 11 p.m., we're going to be recording the newest episode of The Impact Implosion with Seth Draken and Mike Poulin. Uh, we've got two or three weeks of episodes to get caught up there as Mike and Seth have been off doing some other things that they needed to get taken care of. Uh, Friday night, Over the Top Radio with Ed in San Antonio. And he's bringing it every week with news about professional wrestling, mixed martial arts, whatever's on his mind. So, And then hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we will finally get the relaunch of the SmackDown Rundown going. Um, we finally have, have settled on a new second banana for that show. And we will we'll get everything rocking and rolling, and we will be recording that at 11 p.m. on Tuesday nights, right after we get done with the Undisputed Wrestling Show. It's going to be a long night for you. It's a long night every night, buddy. Well, I this week have the week off pretty much. Um, over on Turnbuckle Turmoil, Friday we will have culminating our star month for the show, Max Stardom out of Miami, Florida. On Sunday, on Turnbuckle, we will have Wallaby Joe out of Gouge, one of the original Gouge members. Um, got the week off down at uh, NWA Blue Collar, but gearing up for a big fall. Uh, Casey Carlisle, who will be on this very program in a couple of weeks, going to be making her Pacific Northwest debut in mid-September, so it'll be a blue collar, one of the places she's going to hit, so that place going to be rocking when she gets there. We're looking forward to having her out here, so kind of quiet for me for this week, but make sure you do get out there for NWA blue collar. Lots of big things going on there. A uh, lot of uh, injuries this past show, so might affect the lineup a little bit, but they always put on a great show. Get out there, support it. And in Washington, I believe every promotion ran last Saturday, so I don't think there's any shows in the state of Washington. But September 1st in Bellingham, Washington, up near the Canadian border, there is a brand-new television product that is going to tape their first show. You have people like Ethan HD, the Cunninghams, Dr. Luther all scheduled to be there, so seems like it's going to be very, very high quality, and if you're up in the Bellingham area, you should definitely give them a shot. Awesome. And here on the Undisputed Wrestling Show, coming in the next couple of weeks, next week, we are going to have scheduled with us the Last Warrior, Grey Wolf. We are also going to be joined by Concussion in the second hour. The week after that, on September 6th, uh, as you previously mentioned, we're going to have Casey Carlisle. We are also going to have re the return of the 
always ravishing Buff Bagwell. Um, and then the next couple of weeks after that, we're going to have amazing Nate Matson. We're going to have the mysterious Mavado. And rounding out the end of the month on September 27th, we will be joined in the second hour by Caleb Stills. And we will be joined in the first hour by former WWE superstar Kevin Thorne. Sounds like a very full month there on the Undisputed Wrestling Show. Well, we've, we, we've got a little bit more room for a few more guests, and we are definitely working on that every week. And uh, so hopefully also within the next few weeks, we will get the, the return of the bearded wonder Zane Paisley. We'll get the return of the Morning Star Will Huckabee. Uh, hopefully we'll hear back from Drew Skills where and his travels around the world. Now that his uh, his wrestling career is has picked up a little bit busier for the end of summer and fall, so we'll we'll get caught up with all of our favorite members of the undisputed wrestling show family. I think Zane Paisley is ducking me because he knows full well I was going to point out I was completely right last week and he was wrong when I said that I thought New Day was going to go after the record for longest reign held by demolition. Zane Paisley said that demolition's reign is not recognized. They recognize it as a separate title, and they've already surpassed the recognized mark of Kendrick in London on SummerSlam's broadcast. The commentators specifically pointed out that they were getting closer to demolition's record reign. Well, you know, they only did that because they're they're listening to this show. And that they, doesn't surprise me at all. Why wouldn't they? And they they wanted to try to make fools out of us. Well, out of Zane, I was completely right. But they're 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 obviously listening to the show, which is good. Um, now, if they would just take some some tips uh, from some of the other shows on the Angry Marks Podcast Network and and not be sucking, as Drew Skills would say, with some of the decisions that they're making. Um, it might, it, you know, it might be a respectable show again. Well, I don't see why they wouldn't turn into every show here on the Angry Mark Podcast Network. High quality stuff. I'm sure there's people in Stanford right now discussing each of our programs. They said, "Hey, did you happen to catch the Undisputed Wrestling Show?" And the guy says, "Of course. Did you happen to catch Impact Implosion?" And Vince says, oh, 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 yeah, what was I going to do, watch Total Divas? <laughs> Indeed. Speaking of which, um, Total Divas, there's there's going to be a new spinoff uh, this fall, Total Bellas. What are your thoughts on that? I think that they listened to Total Dudes with Sungai and Rex, took Rex Sharp's idea and brought it into fruition because he called for this well over a year ago. Indeed he did. Indeed he did. Uh, have you seen the, the new series that they've launched, Holy Foley? I watched episode one the other day. I thought it was great. Paulette scares me. She just really scares me. But the rest of the episode, I thought it was great. You Although know, I did feel bad for young Dewey. Yeah. Poor Dewey, just he he just seems sh- so overshadowed by his sister and his dad. Well, the poor kid had some great news, but instead his dad lectures him so vehemently in the Christmas room that his dentures flew out of his mouth. And then when he tried to give them the news at dinner because they said that was the proper time and place to give them the news, they wouldn't let him speak. What 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 kind the the announcement was that that he got a job. What kind of job do you think he got? Well, I've not seen anything past episode 1, so I can only speculate. I might be wrong based on the other episodes I've not seen, but I would say based on episode 1, he probably got a job at a magazine. See, I'm guessing that he was actually recruited as an Amway salesperson. Possibly, but he did discuss writing, and his dad completely went off on him for wanting to write for a living, told him he had no passion for it and was doing it because he thought it was easy, just ripped the poor kid. I bet he went out and he got a job at a magazine, maybe not you know, 
full-time staff member, but maybe he's freelance writing articles for some magazine? Quite possibly. You never know. You'll just have to tune into next week's episode. But yeah, I, w- I was pretty entertained by it as well. Um, seems so far so good. Um, are there any other WWE Network shows you're looking forward to? I want to see this new storytelling show they've advertised since SummerSlam, it looks like it's an animated uh, show that has people telling stories, and they do the animation around the story, uh, similar to uh, what they did on YouTube with Colt Cabana's show, where they animated a few segments of that. So I think that'll be pretty good. Yeah, I saw that as I saw that well, and I don't know. Um, you know, last, earlier this year, I kind of got a little bit excited for, for Camp WWE, and the first couple of episodes were pretty funny, but then the whole show just kind of seemed to fall off a cliff, and, you know, fourth show, I'm, I'm just like, okay, I'm done. 